I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. And you know what? What, what? My father and I told our friends about the new changes in the American Weekly magazine that we get with our Sunday paper. Well, good for you. And they all said that they thought the magazine was better than ever. That's what they said, huh? Mm-hmm. That's what they said, that it was better than ever. And my friends are saying the very same thing. They like the new colors the pictures are being done in and the new type and even the change in the paper. They all like it. Well, it's like we said, it's better than ever. Yes, well, I'm glad you think so. The American Weekly has always been a fine magazine, but the people who put it together wanted to make it better than ever. So I'm happy your father and mother agree that they have. Well, they do. Then everybody's happy. Yes, and then I'll be happy if you'll read me the funnies now. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Hoppy and his friends arrive at Buck Peters' Wyoming ranch. But instead of a fine, well-kept ranch, they discover a rundown place. Buck Peters and his wife are nowhere around and Hoppy can find no trace of it. He goes to the sheriff's office in Rimfire and discovers the two crooks who had stolen the deed to Buck Peters' property wearing badges of the law. Hoppy faces them, saying, I never expected to find you two posing as the law in Rimfire. You better start explaining why Buck Peters and his wife haven't reached the rocking W. Our wagon party was to meet him there. And we found the place deserted. One of the crooks answers, oh, That ranch has been empty ever since the law took it over for Texas. The town's never been able to sell it. Hoppy replies, My guess is you're trying to keep homesteaders off that spread. He goes on, last picture, top row. We found the remains of several partly burned property deeds. But if anything's happened to Buck and Rose, Rimfire's going to need a new sheriff and deputy. One of the crooks gets to his feet, gun in hand. Hey, this fool could be a troublemaker. Can't his guns brag? You'll never have a better chance to kill him in self-defense. Hoppy backs up to the wall. The crooks close in on him. Hoppy reaches his hands over his head, then suddenly grabs a coat hook above his head and swings his feet forward, knocking the wind out of Bragg. As the second one reaches at him, Hoppy slugs him in the jaw. He drops to the floor like a limp sack. Out the door, Hoppy goes, nearly knocking down a richly dressed man outside the door. <coughs> As Hoppy hurries away, the man steps in the door of the sheriff's office, last picture, and stops in astonishment as he sees the two men lying unconscious on the floor. Oh, Hoppy sure fixed those two crooks, didn't he? You bet he did. But one thing troubles me. What? Hoppy's a stranger there in Rimfire, and that man seeing Hoppy going out of the sheriff's office may think Hoppy's an outlaw. Well, those two crooks will be sure to tell him lots of lies about Hoppy. You can be sure of that. Oh, dear. That means more trouble for Hoppy. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now? Well, now can we turn over the page, please, to page three and see what Prince Diane is doing today? All right, let's go over the page and see if he's there. All right. There. See, there he is on page three, like I said. Yes, there he is on page three, like you said. And last week, they baptized the babies and they gave them their names, and I wonder what's going to happen this week. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Frey, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. In the first church to be built in Thule, the twins are christened Valita and Karen. The guests at the ceremony return to their farming, their fighting, or raiding their neighbors, and all is at peace. When disturbing news comes from the south, the king seldom interferes when his people fight among themselves, but this trouble comes from across the border. 
and the king decides that an investigation should be made to find out exactly how dangerous the situation is. Last picture, top row, Prince Valiant and Rufus Regan, glad to have a vacation from peace and contentment, ride forth to see what's happening. First picture, second row. When they reach the Trouble Valley, they hear a strange tale from the natives there. And one morning we found our river dry, and when we tried to cross the border to find the reason, our men drove us back. Now our flocks die of thirst, and our valley becomes a desert. After two days of cautious scouting, Val and Rufus, first picture, bottom row, discover that the enemy has built a dam that holds the water on their side of the border. And where before was a huge and barren wasteland, there is now a lush green valley as the life-giving water cuts a path through the land and irrigates the land so things may grow. Fences are being built and houses. Last picture, Val says softly, So, may ruin one of our valleys to water one of their own. Well, we'll give them water. those people to take the water away from the other people who crossed from the valley there. No, it was not. But Bell says they'll give them plenty of water. I wonder what he means. We'll find that out next week. Well, I hope it doesn't mean a lot of trouble because I saw a western movie one time where someone dammed up a river and then the cattle were thirsty and the ground dried up and everybody got angry and began shooting guns and, and people were killed and everything. Well, let's hope that nothing like that happens to Prince Valiant. Now let's see what we find next. Turn over the page, go past Jungle Jim, turn over that page, and go past Terry Mason and the Lone Ranger, and there, on page seven, is Donald Buckle. Oh, read that, please. All right, say the magic words with me, please. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squid and tick attack. Let's have music, you better quack, quack. Donald is on the phone talking to his girlfriend, Daisy. He's saying... Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I'm getting culture. Culture. Oh, in what form, Donald? I'm going to be an artist as soon as I finish the book. Well, all right, I'll be over to check on your progress. Donald sits down to read his book on culture, which he sure will make him smart enough to be a very fine artist. <laughs> Then he starts to paint a picture. Last picture, top row. As he paints, he first puts in a light bulb, then a patch of sky, then a house roof, and then another house roof upside down. And then the sun at the bottom of the picture. And then he dabs in a few other colors of paint here and there. Then first picture, bottom row, he says, Wow, bang us. Hearing his doorbell ring, he opens the door. It's his girlfriend, Daisy. How's the culture coming? Why, I've just finished my fast stuff job. And Donald shows her the painting. After Daisy looks at it a minute, Donald says, Ah, uh, you think it needs a little touching up, maybe? Daisy says, Well, yes. Uh, just a small detail. I'll take this brush and, um... She takes the brush and makes a few strokes and then says, Last picture? Well, you're all fit. Donald looks at his painting and sees that she has written the word top and bottom on the painting so people will know which way to look at it. And Donald goes... Well, I don't blame her. I don't think that painting makes any sense at all. I don't think it does either. Not the way Donald did it. Anyway, it takes longer than reading one book to become a good artist. You bet it does. It's a wonderful thing, though, to become an artist, if you have the patience. Yes, I love to paint. The colors are so nice. Yes, I think the colors are nice, too. And it's so interesting what you can do with it. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes. Well, now I'm sure you would like to read Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Very well, then, let's pick up the first page of the second section, and the colors are so nice. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. But I'm a fool, I'm a fun, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Saturday noon, down at the office, Dagwood puts on his coat, ready to go home. He says to Mr. Dithers, Are you going to work all Saturday afternoon? Mr. Dithers says angrily, 
Yes. I'm just the boss. Dagwood decides to say no more, and he hurries to the door. Just as he gets to the door, Ditta snarls, Pretty lucky for you to get this beautiful spring afternoon off to just loll around your house. Last picture top row, Dagwood comes up the steps of his house. Thousands of kids inside are creating mayhem, tearing the place apart. Huh, sounds like a riot. Dagwood opens the door and steps in first picture, second row, and is attacked by 30 kids who leap on him and beat him up. Dagwood shrieks. Buddy! And turns around and dashes out of the house. Oh, I forgot Cookie was having a party today. He sees a bus coming down the street, dashes after it, leaps for it, catches it last picture, second row. Oh, back to the peaceful quiet of the office for me. Okay, oh, good time to feed you. First picture, third row. He comes into the office and smiles at Mr. Dither. Dither drops to his knees and kisses Dagwood's hand. Ah, oh, Dagwood, dear boy. You are a jewel indeed to come back to the office to help me. As Dagwood goes to a stack of paper at the desk, Dither says... Nothing to distract. Nothing to disturb us. We'll accomplish wonders this afternoon. Yes, I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> Just then the door opens. And Jitter's wife comes in. Last picture, first row. Judith, Mrs. Mantry and I were going shopping together this afternoon. But her babysitter didn't show up. First picture, bottom row. In comes Mrs. Mantry and her four children. Four ugly little things with fierce looks on their faces. <laughs> Mrs. Dither says, I suggested she leave her little darlings here while we shop. Mrs. Mampy says, I'll pay the regular rate for babysitting. Mrs. Mampy plops her baby on the desk, and out the door the women go. Dagwood takes one look at the kids and then starts climbing out the window. Dithers grabs him by the foot. I come back here, bumpset. Don't desert me when I need you most. And last picture, Dagwood's on the floor, tied up, while the kids pull his hair, shoot at him with slingshots and pop guns, and the baby smears ink and sticky lollipop all over him. And Dagwood shouts, Help! Help! Here sticks his head in the door and says, Stop complaining, Bumstead. You're getting 50 cents an hour for it. <laughs> to get away from all the noise at home. And now he's in worse trouble with those rough kids down at Dither's office. Yes, I'm afraid what Dagwood should have done was to have joined the Navy, got in a submarine, and gone down under the water. That's the only way he could have gotten away from children that day. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. Poor Dagwood, he gets in so much trouble. Oh, look, underneath Dagwood and Blondie, there's Roy Rogers. Read that, please. All right, I will in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip a yo. Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip a yo. <laughs> the girl Nadine, who said she was looking for a job as schoolmistress, and the man named Doan had been brought to Chubby's ranch by Roy and Chubby. When they arrive there, Chubby's blacksmith, Tenpenny, tells them he's caught a stranger who is snooping around the place and has tied him up in the stable. What Roy doesn't know is that the man was Gaucho and that the girl and Doan and Gaucho are working together in an attempt to rob Chubby. When the men get to the stable, they find the crook has slipped away. At the foot of the pole where he was tied, they find a bolo, the weapon used by Gaucho. Roy tells the men to search the spread while he searches the stable. In first picture, he climbs to the hayloft. As he sticks his head through the trap door, <clears throat> he's hit in the head by Gaucho. See, poor Gaucho. I pity I must use the wrong end of my gun for fear of making too much noise. Gaucho pulls Roy up into the hayloft, saying, Hey, lucky for you. My boss, Senor Derby, hates rough stuff. He used his brains to find out where Chubby Walden hide his gold. That last picture, top row... Gaucho looks out the big door the hay is hauled through. He sees Doan standing outside. 
He grabs a rope and starts to slide down, saying, Hey, Senor Dobby, I thought you went with the others. Don't replies. And quiet, you phony vaquero. Bring your burglar tools to Nadine's room. We'll hide you till they stop hunting for you. A short time later, first picture bottom row, Roy, who has regained consciousness, comes out of the stable. He sees Tenpenny and Chubby Walden coming back. Roy says, Hey, that slippery rascal got away, Chubby. I have a hunch he's after your gold wherever you hide it. Chubby answers, It's not hit, Roy. It's right under everyone's nose, where it makes it plumb difficult to find. And as they walk toward the house, Chubby tells Roy, Yes, sir, every doodad in the place has made a gold for my mind, thanks to Tenpenny's skill at the forge. Tenpenny says, Yeah, gold, Roy. Camouflaged with paint. Roy exclaims, Well, that's interesting. But with a thief loose, we better see if the school teacher's safe. Meanwhile, inside the house, Dawn has brought Gaucho to Nadine's room and tells her she has to hide Gaucho there. Nadine doesn't like the look of things and says she doesn't want to hide him. And just then, there's a knock on the door. Dawn whispers to Nadine, Now, shut up. Gaucho stays till dark, and then we start looking for the gold again. Quickly, Gaucho hides himself in a huge chest in the room. Last picture. Doan runs for the window. He knocks over a statue. Roy, outside the door, calls. Hey, Miss Drake, are you okay? What's that noise? Nadine answers. Oh, I'm all right, Roy. Uh, I just knocked over a statue. And then she says to herself, Goodness, that sounded heavy. I wonder... What do you think she's thinking? Well, I think she thinks that statue is made of gold. I am afraid of that myself. Oh, I hope Roy catches Gaucho and Dawn before she has a chance to tell those crooks where the gold is. Well, we'll find that out next week. But now let's go over the page. Oh, look, there's Flash Gordon, and I'm so anxious to read this. Because you remember, Flash had been captured by the giants on the planet Rhea. Yes, and he had captured one of the rocket ships and was hoping to escape to Earth. But it didn't work. Because his ship was captured and he was brought back before the king of the giants to be punished. And then some of the giants caught the smallpox, the disease the giants cannot withstand. And Rube, that man whose son got sick of the smallpox, thinks that it's Flash's fault. And so he wants to kill Flash because of it. Yes, and now let's see what happens next. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega, rega, doon, doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash warns the king. The disease will ravish your planet. Your only hope is to make peace with Earth and secure vaccine from our laboratory. But before the king can reply, Rube, maddened with fever and blaming Flash for his plight, makes a wild attempt to kill the Earthman. Stop, Rube! Rube, stop! Only the king's quick intervention saves Flash's life. Last picture, top row. His violent onslaught overtaxes Rube's waning strength, and he falls lifeless. <laughs> Ignoring the stricken warrior, the king addresses Flash. This girl Dale's life will be forfeit unless my people get the vaccine of which you speak. I warn you, Gordon, if you fail, you shall watch her die. First picture, bottom row, hurrying to the most powerful space scanning station on Reef. Flash tries desperately to make contact with Dr. Zarkov on Earth. After anxious hours of failure, the doctor's face appears on the screen. Flash cries, Zarkov, blast off for Rhea at once with smallpox vaccine for 100,000 inoculations. Meanwhile, Dale ignores the threat that hangs over her and works tirelessly as a nurse for the stricken victims. The list of sufferers grows by the hour. One of the most serious cases is Rube's daughter, Kara. Last picture. Back on Earth, Zarkov loses no time in rounding up a huge store of vaccine and other medical supplies. Within 24 hours after receiving Flash's call for help, Zarkov is rocketing toward the enemy moon in an interplanetary race against death. gets there in time to save the lives of those giants. So do I, because if the medicine doesn't get there, they're sure to die. And if they die, the king is apt to take Dale's life as he said he would. Well, what do you think will happen? Well, we'll wait till next week and find that out. 
Everything depends on Zarkov getting there safely. And we'll find out about that next week. Now can we please read Dick's adventures? Because I just have a feeling that Dick will be starting a new adventure today. I have the same feeling. So let's go to the very last page. All right. And there he is. You see, Dick's lying under the tree. And I'll bet you he will go to sleep. And I'll bet you he will have a new adventure. Well, let's get to that right now. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack, a zack, a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick and his cousin Dan are out on a trip in the woods on a picnic. As Dick lies under a tree relaxing, his cousin says, Hey, Dick, you ever think if I first used the words, don't give up the ship? What was Captain James Lawrence? They were his dying words. It was way back in... Hey, Dick. Wake up, Dick! But reality is melted into a dream. And in its spell, Dick goes back, back with the years. It's the month of May in the year 1813 in old Boston. Last picture, top row, Dick is walking down the street with his cousin Dan. He sees a ship that blocks the harbor. Cousin Dan says to Dick, Hey, Dick, take a look. She's still blockading us. First picture, second row. Like a great dark bird of prey, His Majesty's frigate Shannon flies relentlessly back and forth just outside Boston Harbor. But within the harbor, protected by shore batteries, lies its prey, the American ship, the Chesapeake. Dick and Dan look at the ship within the harbor, and Dan says, Hey, there she is, Dick. The U.S. frigate Chesapeake just returned from a long raiding voyage against the King's ships. Last picture, second row, Dick says thoughtfully, Hey, they're pretty evenly matched, Dan. Golly, I wonder who'd win if they fought. First picture, bottom row, at dockside, part of the Chesapeake crew are whispering in grim, long-faced groups. Dan says cheerfully, Hey, hello, what's the matter here? You're not afraid of that royal raft out there, are you? Last picture, one of the sailors from the Chesapeake answers, Afraid? That's the wrong word to use to a sailor in the U.S. Navy, matey. But hearken, there's a jinx on this Chesapeake. From the day she first touched water, he's had nothing but bad luck. She's jinxed, I tell you. I wonder why that ship is jinxed. Well, the sailor says the ship has had nothing but bad luck. Well, it's certainly bad luck to be where it is now because that ship can't even go outside the harbor. No, if it tries to go out of the harbor, it'll be attacked by the English ship, the Shannon. Well, I wish we could find out some more about this. We'll find out more about it next week. Now, let's find out the new things that are happening with Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. Because you remember that man named Colorado Colby wants to buy horses for Mr. Miles. Yes, Mr. Miles has decided to sell the horses to Mr. Colby. But he's also decided that he wants Tex and Rusty to go along with the horses to see that they're treated properly. Yes, but there was a strange man last week whose name was Blackie who was doing some scheming with a sea captain. And I'm sure they're not up to anything good. I'm sure of the very same thing. Now let's see if we can find out anything about that now. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for us, horse and rusty. Tex and Mr. Miles are out at the paddock, looking at the horses and talking. Mr. Miles is saying to Tex, I uh, had the bank and the association look Mr. Colby up, Tex. His financial rating's good, and his business is apparently on the level, so I see no reason why I shouldn't sell him some horses. Tex replies, Well, I'm right glad to hear he's okay, boss. I'm always a speck cherrier that makes to pleasant hombre. Too much of a built-in smile, if you get my meaning. Yes, I understand, Tex. But he's an old circus and carnival man, which is probably the reason for his manner. But anyway, I'm sending you and the boys along with the horses. picture top row, Mr. Miles is talking with Colorado Colby in his study. Uh, Mr. Colby, I have picked out 12 horses which I'll sell. Providing you agree to a certain condition I must impose. Happy to hear it, Mr. Miles. Very happy indeed. Just name the price and I'll wire my bank for a cashier's check at once. First picture bottom row, Mr. Miles says. Uh, you see, Mr. Colby, my horses are a little more than just commercial products to me. I uh, like to know where they go and how they're treated. So I want Tex, Rusty, and Pete to go along with him. Oh, of course, of course. Matter of fact, I'm delighted. But I should warn you, it'll take some time. These horses are for custom in Florida. You deliver them to my farm on Delaware Bay, and we'll then send them on by ship. Mr. Miles nods. Certainly, certainly. 
three big vans should take care of them? A little later, Rusty and Pete are talking. They pack for the trip. Rusty exclaims, Boy, oh boy, this is going to be fun, Pete. A trip to the East Coast and then on a ship all the way to Florida. Pete laughs. Yeah, hope I don't get seasick. I never been on a ship. Meanwhile, many miles away, last picture on Delaware Bay on the seacoast, the man named Blackie is looking at a ship anchored out at the end of the pier. He says to the sea captain, So that's the ship, huh, Captain? She sure isn't any Queen Mary. Cappy answers, eh, No, Blackie, he's a tub. She could do with a little paint and a new gear, but she'll be seaworthy, at least as long as we need her to be. Well, we do know from last week that he has a crooked plan in mind. Yes, and that crooked plan has something to do with that ship. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. And something else we'll find out. Next week, we have a surprise oh, for you. Oh, goody. What is a surprise? Beginning next week, the Comic Weekly is going to have one more new comic. And this one will be called Big Ben Bull. It's a story of prize fighters. Oh, I love that. I love boxing. Well, you will enjoy Big Ben Bull, I'm sure. And we'll read that next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, i got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Pucks the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.